Hello, Facebook world, if you're out there watching today, we want to welcome you. We encourage you, if you're out there, to let us know that you're there. Uh, talk to Miss Sam today as she's recording in the back and, uh, and everything else. She'll be putting some comments out there to kind of keep you up with the sermon. And let us know where you're at and you're okay. If you're healthy, you're happy, you need some prayer, uh, just uh, for whatever reason. We're glad you're here. We know we got folks from all over that watch. And so uh, I'm excited to be able to share this message. If you can't see my shirt, I want to share with you today that Jesus loves you and so do we. And uh, we're glad to be here today and to share this message. I want to welcome all of y'all as well. And thanks for coming out in this brutally cold weather uh, during a continuing difficult season of COVID. We're glad you're here, though. We're safe, we're happy, and we're healthy, and we're going to spend a few minutes in God's Word uh, today. But before we do that, I do want to give you some announcements. It's important to try to keep you as connected as possible. It's really tough. I know it is, but we want to tell you what we got going on. Um, tonight, we will be meeting in our small groups at 6 o'clock. We encourage you guys, if you feel a little bit shut in or you haven't had a chance to get out as much, and you'd like to be around some other brothers and sisters to build some relationships and to really get in uh, God's Word and minister together, come out at 6 o'clock tonight. I think the, the weather's going to clear up. It's going to be a beautiful day today. Maybe give you an opportunity to get out tonight and be a part of that. We plan on being back this Wednesday for worship in person at 6.30. Our youth group will be back at 6.30, and our Facebook Live will be going at 6.45, and we're slowly getting back into in-person ministries and everything else, and we're kind of making adjustments as we see fit. So we're going we're gonna to continue to keep you notified of all the changes. And coming very soon, I believe it's March 5th. I didn't have the date when I made the slideshow, so I just put coming soon. Uh, it's March 5th, though. I know it now because I saw the flyer this morning. March 5th, get those little girls signed up for our annual Little Girls Night Out, which is an amazing, amazing time. Um, and I know that because my daughters and my wife and all my friends tell me about it, and it's just amazing. And I've seen it. I'm chocolate fountains, strawberries, princess stuff, pedicures, manicures, it's all there. So it's going to be a great night out. We're able to do all of our ministry to continue, even some, through some difficult times where uh, it's, it's tough to have people gathering together. We're able to do everything we've always done uh, because of the support of our ministry. And when you're here with us, there's always baskets in the back that you can drop a tither and offering in. But we also have some other ways that you can give, and that helps us so much because you can't be here all the time when you'd like to give. You can give through our church app. If you don't have it, search whatever app store that is on your device, Refuge Church of NC. Get it downloaded. It's free. It gives you notifications. It lets you, you can watch past sermons. It tells you about ministry events coming up. It tells you all about our church. And it also uh, is a great way to be able to give because there's a give tab there on the home screen. You can set it up, and it's real easy to do. You can give by texting Silver Refuge to 833-445-6325. It's safe. It's effective. It's the same kind of it's the same services through our app there. Or you can just send it in. Mail it in to P.O. Box 872 right here in Dillsborough, 28725. All right? So... That's everything going on, and so far this year, I know we've had, it's been hit or miss with services. I mean, it's been tough. We've had a couple of online services. We've had some in person. We've had, I mean, we've had, we've had the whole gamut this month. We've had only online. We have had in person with both services, and now we're doing just one service today because it was so brutally cold, and the roads might have been a little slick this morning. So we have, though, throughout the year, we've given you a message every week. We've done that. God's been faithful to be able to give us the opportunity to do it, whether it's through a camera or through in-person and fellowship. And we've talked about walking the path of prayer as we seek Jesus this year. We want to continue to seek him in all things through the circumstances. It is a strategy for us to navigate God's path. We need to make it a habit uh, as a part of our spiritual strategy to seek God and seek Jesus Remember that he made a, a habit of prayer, Jesus did, and it should be our first move, not our last resort. I shared with you an online message called My Bible is Alive uh, from my living room when we had the six or eight inches of snow. And, uh, and I shared with you that God's Word is so important. It is alive because when we read it, it shows us who we really are. And because of that, it shows us our desperate need for Jesus because it reveals our innermost thoughts and desires and who we are. So we need to put the Word of God in action, follow Jesus, trust that it will lead us to freedom. And then last week we shared about being alive in Christ and to experience true life. Uh, we need to acknowledge God's greatness, honor Him and trust Him and know that He will supply. He'll give us healing, hope, strength and confirmation um, and everything I've spoke about so far this year on Sunday mornings have, has all had to do with our own individual 
walk with Jesus and seeking him personally through prayer, through reading God's word, through knowing what this true life is for us individually. So today I'm going to speak to us more corporately as a church, and I want us uh, to do this today. I want, to, I want to talk about what it means to seek God together. We're going to look in Ephesians 3 and 4 primarily. We're going to, it's going to have some, some, some carryover from the end of Ephesians 3 into the beginning of chapter 4. And then I've got a whole lot of supporting scripture. I thought about typing it up there, but I got a little lazy and just said I got a bunch. Uh, so if you like Bible drill or one of those games where you want to keep up in your Bible or maybe see how fast you can tap on your screen and find it, I'll be all over scripture today to show you the, to show you the importance of this. And, and before we do, you know, we, we talked about this. Uh, talk about this often to kind of use our own imagination and our own kind of maybe like picturing what it might be if, if we as a church just made it our purpose and our goal, but keep things very simple, to be united as we grow forward, to grow in Christ personally, therefore we grow corporately, spiritually, God takes care of the rest, to show grace to those who stumble along the way, to rejoice when we experience the good, to encourage when we face the bad and the uncertain, and to go all in for Christ and each other. And that's really what the goal of this church is and what we want to do. And we want to look at some scripture today that Paul writes to the church of Ephesus. It's really pertinent to us today to put this in action and to remember it for us as we seek God together. He starts off in verse 20. Y'all know this is one of my favorite verses of the Bible. We've seen this one before. He, he finishes up ver, uh, chapter 3 by saying this to the church. All glory to God who is able to through his mighty power at work within us. So this involves all of us going forward together with us, individually and corporately, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church. So this is what we're talking about today is the church. We give God glory and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Now this is the start of chapter 4. Therefore, so he starts a lot of chapters that way. So when you start your Bible study and you have that in the beginning, you need to go back a couple of verses. Because of the reasons stated there in verses 20 and 21, Paul, a prisoner for serving the Lord, beg you to lead a life worthy of your calling. We're all called to follow Jesus, for you have been called by God. Always be humble and gentle. Man, I liked it up to that part right there. Always be humble and gentle. Be patient with each other, making allowance for each other's faults because of your love. Not because of your righteousness, not because of your goodness, but because you love one another. And then this verse 3 talks about our, our part in this, what we have to do. We, get, we don't just sit back. We make every effort to keep ourselves as a church and as believers united in the Spirit, binding yourselves together with peace. There ought to be a spirit of peace in this place as we worship. For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. I want to give you a few points today and encourage you as we look at some more supporting scripture about being united, seeking God together as a church, and, and just some of the things that God's laid on my heart to share with you this week and the importance of it. The first thing is this. It's, it's, it, this is just kind of a mission statement, but there's a great point today to maybe get in your heads. I want us to commit to go all in for God together for his glory. As a church, realizing that we are greater than the sum of our parts through the power of the Holy Spirit, God can do great things through us as a church. It can start in this room. It can start with you watching out there. When you're a part of this together, we want to commit to go all in for God, do it together, and do it for his glory. We're called as Christians, as brothers and sisters, to walk together for God's glory. It starts by loving God, I said this before, I want to say it again, and it's a great reminder today. If we want to love our church and the people within it, if we want to truly love people the way that God has called us to love people, we must first love Him with all of our heart. Love God with all of your heart, then love one another, and get out of this idea that it's a, I don't know, that, that we have to find fault in one another, not necessarily within the church, but with other churches, with other Christians. No kind of competition mindset to, to love God, to love one another, and to truly be one for Him. No idea of, you know, and I talk about this, sometimes these things creep into churches, and we need to have a reminder from time to time about the things that we need to, to not kind of 
go towards in some things that we need to kind of seek. But there, there doesn't need to be an idea of spiritual superiority or a spirit of criticism towards others, but one that always begins when we deal with one another as brothers and sisters in the church moving forward together. We will move forward together much uh, more efficiently and effectively for God's glory when we begin our interactions with one another in grace. The way that God begins his interactions with us. We're going to model that in the way that we deal with one another. And to, to, to begin every interaction with an attitude of grace, because that's how God deals with us. And, and, and I can say this on the authority of Scripture, that Jesus' desire for us as a church is to be one. One mindset, one spirit, one body moving forward. Listen, now, we, we, we pray a lot. Jesus teaches us in the Scripture how to pray. What about, do you know what Jesus has prayed for you? He has prayed for you. It's in the Bible. It's right there in Scripture, and it's found in the Gospel of John in verse 17. Jesus says this, I am praying not only for these disciples, those who were following him at the time. This is where you have a place in the Bible. But also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. That's you. That's me. That's us. That's our church. Right there in Scripture, because we believe in Jesus. He goes on in verse 21 and says, I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and, that, and may they be in us. Well, that's a lot. That's, that's, a lot of, that's, that's kind of a tough little sentence to read right there. Y'all give me some grace. All right. I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one, as you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us. I highlighted the next part because you're going to see this come up again later in the sermon, and you're going to see the importance of it in Scripture when we reach out to the world so that the world will believe you sent me. My wife and I were looking at Scripture last night, and you know, we, and we found this verse in John 16, 9, I believe. It's just, it's, it's in the, and it was New Living Translation. And I was like, do you know that in this one verse, if you take it out of context and just read it, Jesus says right there what the sin of the world is. John 16, 9. The sin of the world is that they do not believe in me. That's it. It's, I, 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 we were really struck by that last night as we were reading it, and we kind of took it out of context and just said, well, he's real. It's in red. It's right there in your Bible. That's the sin of the world. So... When we are united as a church and we come together as one in love with one spirit, that helps the world to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. We have a part in, in helping folks to believe that. He says, I have given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. Oh, I got through that screen. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity, here it is again, that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. Father, I want those whom you have given me to be with me where I am. Then you can see all the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. These are the words of Jesus in a prayer about us to be unified. To be unified in love as brothers and sisters, to seek God together in love so the world may know who Jesus is. We can make a difference. Don't tell me the church doesn't make a difference. It's a massive difference maker in the world. This is his prayer for us, and I know we pray to him, but what if we could answer this prayer for Jesus to be, to be united? And, and this idea of how we look at the world and how we love one another and how we know that we all need Jesus, because we know this, that, and listen, I understand to an, a great degree, and I, I experienced incredible frustration under, with this kind of understanding and this tension of I can't help what other people think, say, or do. I mean, like, and so when it comes to the church and me as a Christian, what people, their preconceived notions, I can't help, I can't, I mean, like, there's nothing I can do about that, all right? So I understand that. Having said that, the world's view of, of, of Christians, I would say oftentimes is not one of love. Not even towards one another, much less towards them. That we don't, that, that there's not a lot of love within the church. And, and, and listen, I, but I understand people can, 
take one bad church experience at one church on the other side of the country and they can apply it to every single church and so it has no, I, I get that. I know, see, man, we got a lot of nodding going on up in here right now because that's, that's just what, that's what happens. It's what happens. We know how people like to take one thing and make a broad generalization, but I would say this, that as a church, we can always improve in showing love and unity so that the world might look at us and go, well, I can't find any fault. I'm not saying they're perfect, but I can't find fault there. We can't find blame. Jesus calls us. We're called to be blameless and fault. Like, we're not going to be perfect, but people can look at that church, this little refuge here in Silver, North Carolina, and go, man, they love each other. They believe in Jesus. And, and that will help us to impact them. And listen, this is uh, some great instructions for us as a church and as believers on how to carry ourselves in Philippians, I, I, remember, remember, I didn't like, I, I, I liked the first part of the screen we read a little while ago, and then when it talked about be humble and gentle, <sighs> struggle. This starts off right, right off the bat telling us what, some things we can do to promote unity and to promote love and to go forward together. And the very beginning of this will hit you like a ton of bricks. I know it did me. Do everything without complaining and arguing. Why? Again, what's that? Listen, again, we can't control everything about what the outside world or those who don't believe in Jesus don't, don't belong to. We can't control everything, but at least if we do everything without complaining and arguing, they can't criticize that. See, I mean, that's what Paul says, so that no one can criticize you. Live clean, innocent lives. Not perfect, but hey, like we don't want to be going out and, 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 and live good lives. As children of God, shining like bright lights in a world full of crooked and perverse people. See, some of y'all are like, yes, I know, that's right. See, if that's the only part you're identifying with, you're missing the rest of it, okay? We know it's crooked, it's perverse out there. It's a lot of crazy things going on. But let's remember to do what we've been called to do because we are living in this world. So hold, hold firmly to the word of life. Hold firmly to Jesus during this time. And, and don't argue, don't complain. And, and I know, listen... I, I'm not saying you can't understand. Please, out there watching too. I'm not saying you can't have a complaint. I'm not saying there aren't times we won't see eye to eye. I'm saying that when we do those things, we need to remember uh, that, that we need to find some, 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 some common ground there, which is Jesus, and we need to work through it, and we don't need to just make a habit of complaint. Hey, we might offend it. But offend one another once in a while. My wife put something a while back. She actually put something good on Facebook. I swear I saw it. I scrolled through and I saw something good on Facebook. Um, it's true. It can happen. She put something like this on Facebook, and I think it's a great thing. Like, bad things are going to happen. It has something to this effect that um, everyone will be offended, okay? Everyone's going to get offended, but not everyone has to choose to, to, to live offended, Something along those lines, right? We, we all get offended, but we can choose to forgive or we can choose to live offended always. And we need to forgive one another. We need to do these things. And, and, and we need to understand that a lot of the things that we, that we bicker, hey, listen, y'all know this. If you're married or you got kids, a lot of the things that we argue about as in those relationships aren't really important. You know, they kind of come and go. A lot of times in the church, the same thing is true. And, 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 and I, I think about this about my girls, and many of you have raised kids, or maybe you're in the process of raising them now, or you're taking care of them, and I think for me, one of the, one of the biggest frustrations, maybe the only frustration I have with my daughters, because I just adore them, and I want to be around, like, I can't be around them enough, well, yeah, I can't, um, I don't want to lie, I don't want to lie, um, there are times when daddy needs to run. Um, but I would say my, my greatest frustration by far is when they fight and argue with one another. As their father, my greatest frustration isn't the mistakes that they make. I want you to think about like maybe how God, like think of this. Think of this right here because God spoke to me through this. My greatest frustration as their father is not the mistakes that they make. It's not... You know, the learning process, it's not growing, it's not having to teach them basics sometimes, reminding them of things. It's not any of that. My greatest frustration as their father is when I look down at my children, 
and they're fighting and arguing with one another. How, how do you think, if that frustrates me in my flesh as just this earthly father, how much more, and, I, and again, I'm not trying to say, I'm not trying to say we, that I think like God, I'm, I'm not saying that, but I want you to just, uh, I think you get this analogy. How much more do you think it frustrates our heavenly father to see his children arguing about trivial things? I got to believe that it does. We're instructed all through scripture to not complain and not argue. So I know like, and here's the thing. It is not like, and this is, I'm going to add to that level of frustration as a father, and I think you can probably see what I'm talking about in church, how we, we can sometimes, as churches, or it, it's not even as a church, as Christians, as Christians, we can argue about things that just, they're so trivial, they don't matter. My, with my daughters, like, like, my biggest frustration is when, uh, when they start arguing because it's never over anything important. Never. Ever, 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 ever are they arguing about any life-changing, important issue. I, this week, I had to have a 10-minute intervention with my two daughters because they were just going at it. And I mean, I can hear, and we can hear it when they do. We know it like we're like, they're squabbling again. Like we kind of joke about like we know they're fighting a little bit. So I go outside, and I'm going to tell you, like, this was, this was a knockdown drag out, and it was, it was of the utmost importance, because here's what happened. They were playing superheroes, and they could not agree on wh who should have the superpower of shape-shifting and who should have the superpower of having a force field around them. And they had almost come to blows about this. And they were arguing, and they were pointing about it, and like, because one of them, listen, I'm telling you, like, she always, she always gets to be the shape shifter, and I, I want to be the shape shifter. She can have the force field this time, and uh, and, I, and I, ten minutes, y'all, ten minutes, and I did everything, y'all. I'm telling you what, I'm sitting there crying out to Jesus in those moments, and I am. I, I, I I'm, I was like, all right, I'm gonna show them a patient father. One who bears with their pettiness, and I'm going to get them through this, and I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to show them the power of compromise and that we can actually walk away from this still loving one another. And I mean it, 10 minutes, 10 minutes went on, and we never really got anywhere. <laughs> I would say this, it got worse. Because not only was there an argument about that, I come to find out in the course of my trying to, you know, mediate this, that they also, it wasn't just about their superpower, it was about their, their character traits, and they were arguing over which one could be sweet and which one was going to be brave. And I'm like, man, I don't know if I can fall. I don't know if I'll ever get to the bottom of this. And you know what I wanted to yell? But of course I didn't. It doesn't matter! It's fake. It's not really real. You can, you know what? Be a shapeshifter and have a force field around you. And you too. And be brave and sweet. I don't know. We tried to work. I tried every possible combination of working it out, and I left there going, y'all can figure it out. <laughs> I think sometimes God's just like, I'm just throwing his hands up. Like, I can't believe they're arguing about these things. I can't believe when the outside world doesn't believe in Jesus, the church is arguing about such things that are so petty and I understand, we, we, listen, I'm not telling you don't have a preference. Have a preference. So it's okay. But understand that when we all come together, we're, we're going to have to give and take just a little bit about some things. And, and I, I can just picture God arguing, just, just looking about, at some of the things, you know, politics. We bring politics into spiritual debate, or we bring candidates, or music, or pews, or seats, or versions of the Bible, or how we dress, and this and that. And you see these things, and they're kind of stereotypical, but I can just Picture the heart of God breaking over these things. They're not important. Y'all need to come together on this. And he's upset because his kids can't get along. So the rest of the world's going, I don't want that. <laughs> I got enough going on. But what if they saw a place where it's like, man, they, they love each other. Like, there are some way different kind of people in this place.
And they're, 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 they're jacked up people and jacked up people and these people come from here and these people come from here and these people got money and these people ain't got money and these people got great jobs, they ain't got great jobs. These people don't have any kids, these people got a ton of kids. They got older people, younger people, they're all together, they're loving each other. It's, I, don't, I can't really figure it out. What's well, about Jesus? Oh, well, tell me about this. I'd love to be a part of that. Who don't want to be a part of that? Who don't want to be a part of coming together where you can actually be yourself, you can drop the act, you can, you can share your weaknesses, your struggles, you can be encouraged, you can know that you're human, you can know that we're all in this together and that there's a lot of things that aren't important. What is important is that we come together because in the end, none of that little petty stuff we argue about is going to matter. In the end, what's going to matter is, are we going to stand before Jesus? And is he going to say, well done? That's what I want. That's our desire. So we got to get along, and so here's what it takes. And, and again, Scripture gives us, and I'm going I'm to pull one particular verse out because I think we've, we've read a lot about this before, but here's how we do it is we commit to fight the enemy, not others, not each other, not other people. Like, we're, like we're, not, we're not here to fight and argue and like try to have our way about things. we gotta, we got to, because we're not the enemy. Like other people aren't the enemy. we got to commit to fight the enemy. We've got one enemy, one real enemy. You can call him whatever you want. Satan, Lucifer, the liar, the deceiver, the beast, the destroyer. I don't care. That's your preference. That's fine. We won't argue about that. You call him what you want. He's the enemy. We agree with that. And his purpose is to divide, to use division so we have no vision. When he divides, when he uses division in the church, the church does not have a vision to move forward. And so, listen, we're not each other's enemy. The church down the street's not our enemy. The friend who's not a Christian who supports the other candidate's not an enemy. Whatever that, that's, they're not the enemy. Satan is, and we need to unite against him. And the Bible's real clear. One little verse, pull right out of Scripture right here. Ephesians 6, 12, Paul reminds the church. This is that same church we looked at earlier. So like, it's the same, it's the same, but he's right into the same church. We're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. That's people. But against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. See, in, in Scripture, Jesus tells us real clearly what the purpose of our enemy is that we see in this Scripture right here. His purpose is to steal and kill and destroy. John 10, 10, that's what Jesus says. He wants to steal our unity, he wants to kill our churches, and he wants to destroy Christianity. That's what he wants to do. He's literally hell-bent on trying to defeat us however he can, and he never lets up, and it's why we have to stay vigilant, and we have to be reminded of these things from time to time. And it's why, as a church and as believers, number four, we have to do, uh, where am I at? Oh, there we are, number three, I'm sorry, number three, number three, you're right, you're right. I'm reading my Roman numerals wrong. As a body of believers, we must have one heart and one purpose for Jesus. It's that, like, that's what it needs to boil down to. One heart for Jesus, one purpose for Jesus. We just all become so compassionate and generous and loving to those inside and outside that the presence of God just could not be denied in our life. It can't happen, but it has to start here. It starts with me. It starts with you. I mean, think of, what, think of the common sense of Scripture that if we can't love one another as brothers and sisters in Christ, and if we struggle and we have all these petty arguments, why, why would the world want to believe that Jesus is who he says he is? Or why, how, why would they want to be a part of a body of believers moving forward in faith? But it, listen, it can't happen. Our love for each other through Jesus is the way that the world will know we belong to him. We've seen this already about the world, like our love the world, our love the world. Listen to this in John 13, 34, and 35. Jesus says, I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other. There it is again. Just as I've loved you, you should love each other. So if you want to, if you're watching, or maybe you're here, and you want to go, okay, well, I want to I wanna know more about this love that I need to have for my brothers and sisters. I want to know about the love I need to have for those in Christ and, and the love I can show those outside. You can take the last part of verse 34, and you can highlight that in your Bible, or you can, you can meditate on that, and you can pray about that and go, well, how do I need to love them? Jesus says, the way that I love you. And you just think about how Jesus loves you. 
Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. See, they'll look at that. The world will look and go, hmm, that's a different kind of love. That's a different kind. That's not something I can... See, I, I can get... Lord knows, y'all, I can get petty arguments and division, and I can get, like, I, I can have all of those things. I can be made to feel bad. I can have all of that in the world. I don't need to come to church and get a double dose of it. <laughs> Let's love one another. It's what Jesus says. And we do it, we do it because Jesus' last words for us were, hey, listen, he said, go, go out there and make disciples. How are we going to make disciples? How are we going to prove to the world that Jesus is who he is? Because we love each other. We're, listen, we want to be used for his glory to reach the world as a church and together. We're, we want to be, a, 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 listen, we're a church and our, our, name, our name tells you this. We, we exist as a refuge for those to come in to know Jesus, to experience his love, his grace, his forgiveness, his peace, his joy, his hope and a fellowship that will sustain us in a world that desperately needs him. And we're not going to give up. Man, I'm telling you what, it had been easy the last few years to, to have given up and to some degree or just been like, you know, I don't know, if, you know. But we're not going to give up. We're not going to give up this idea of being a body of believers. We're not going to give up being the body of Christ. We're not going to give up meeting together. Whatever circumstances might try to keep us from doing that, and I understand that people can't be here every single time we open the door, but we're going to open these doors, and we're going to be here when we can, and we're going to gather, and we're going to fellowship, because it is important to do that. Myself, other pastors that I'm friends with, people that I've talked to, they have seen it with their own eyes, this, this decline in... Fellowship, and listen, I, we can't, some of the things we've had to do, we, we've, had to, we've had to pull the reins back a little bit. And because of that, we've seen brothers and sisters who have struggled. And again, some of this is beyond our control, but we've seen people, and y'all know this, that when, you, when, when something comes up, maybe beyond your control, and you can't make it to fellowship, you miss out on that, you're not there, it becomes easier the next time to miss. And the next time to miss... And before you know it, you know what we are as human beings? We're all creatures of habit. You won't, you, if you say, I'm not, well, then you can lie to yourself if you want to. We all are. We all are creatures of habit. And we want to come together. We're not going to give up on it. There will be things that keep us from it from time to time. We won't, we won't be able to do everything. Work, sickness, we get all that. All right? But we can't give up because some things can only be experienced when we gather together and worship in community. They really can. I mean, if you were here at our 9 a.m. service last week, you kind of know that. You experienced that. There was something special about just being in the presence of the Holy Spirit with our brothers and sisters who many of them going through a lot of this. And Not that the 11 o'clock wasn't awesome too, but... We just happened, God's timing at that 9 o'clock service last week was something that I tried to explain it, even to Caleb when he showed up for the 11 o'clock service. And I said, dude, that 9 o'clock was awesome. And he goes, well, what was it? I go, I can't even tell. I, it, I, it's hard to explain it. You have to be there to experience it. We're going to continue to, listen, as a church, we're going to be a promise-trusting, unity-pursuing, bold-moving, kingdom-minded, love-showing church, and we're not going to give up on those ideas. And a great reminder is found in Hebrews, like, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break this down, because this is going to be up here for a little while, Kayla, and I'm fully aware of how much I'm about to interrupt myself. We've read this many times. Let us consider how to stir up one another. Me, you, you, me. Let's stir one another, and how are we going to stir it? To love and good works. To love and good works. How do we stir one another up? In love. Not gossip, not dissension, not constant complaining. How, I, listen, and I'm going to tell you, and I, I probably speak for a million pastors out there too, and I, I don't want to, but I, I mean, maybe I am. You could, you know, whatever. I, I'll tell you, listen, a complaint is one thing. Chronic complaining, chronic complaining about, well, I'm just not, you know, whether it's this church or any church. All right, listen, I love you, but if you don't want to be here, I want you to find somewhere where you're happy. 
I, I can't, I, 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 I love, but like, you know, just, just, I don't know, just, we want to come together and stir up love, all right? Not conflict, not criticism, but love towards one another. And then he goes on and says, hey, don't neglect to meet together. As is the habit of some. How, and I get, let, let me just ask you this. This was written 2,000 years ago. How did it become a habit for some? It's not, that, not and that, by the way, that's not a trick question. You know how it became a habit? Because they did it one time, and they did it two, and they did it four, and then it became eight. So it became a habit because they, they, stopped, they stopped meeting together. It became a habit. So let's not do that, but let's encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near, as we see the end drawing near. Don't neglect. It's easy to fall into that habit. It is. It's tough. But we just we encourage you to be here every week. The church has such a vital role moving forward in this world. The body of believers, the meeting of believers, the worship together, the fellowship, we need that. We need that. And we're going to gather. We're going to continue to do it. And listen, and, and, and we're, going to, we're going to do this, and we're going to continue to move forward. And, and, and we know that God has great things in store. And we know, too, this last part is that God's desire is for us to share the good news of Jesus Christ. We do that when we experience it together here as a body of believers. Then we can share it with the outside world. God desires for us to not only live in worship of Him, but on mission for others. Live on mission. Listen, live in worship of God and on mission to reach others because the world needs us to do it, whether it's our families, our friends, our coworkers, our fellow students. All of us need to live in relationship with Jesus, in relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and, and, and we've given that opportunity to reach others and do that. And, and understand this. Listen, this idea of moving forward together as a church, I, I'm just... Like, I, I don't want to over-spiritualize things. I don't want to make things that, something that they're not. But I'll tell you this, okay? There's a reason why it's really hard for you to get up on Sunday mornings and to get here on time, whether it's cold outside or whether you've had a long week or whether it's just, like, the only day you get a chance maybe to... The enemy is doing everything he can to keep you. That is spiritual warfare. Keep trying to keep you out of church. Because I'm telling you, listen, there, there are some things that Satan hates, and I can certainly tell you, too, that he does. All right? He hates worship. He hates when, what, when no matter what we're going through, no matter what our circumstances are, no matter how tired we are or how tough our week's been, he hates it when we'll get up and we go, you know what? I'm going to go worship God anyway. He hates that. So he'll do anything he can do to keep you from experiencing it. He hates worship. And another thing he hates is this. He hates the Word of God. Where else are you going to gather together with folks and get a chance to get in and, and get into God's Word and study it the way that you can in your local church? It's just not going to happen. Where you can teach, where we can get in it and we can chew on it and learn from it and dissect it and, and just apply it to our lives. He hates this. He's been trying to disprove it from the beginning of time. Do you know what the very first words he said in Scripture to Eve were? See, Eve, Adam, there's Adam and Eve. We all know the story. They're hanging out. Man, the garden's the place to be, right? I mean, like, it's perfect, right? It's the place to be. And when Eve mentioned the one thing God had told them about the tree, we cannot eat from this tree, do you know what, do you know what Satan said? This is what he said. Is that what God really said? He's been trying to disprove God's word. He hates God's word. But when we cling to it and we come together and we worship and we get in the word of God, he hates it when you get in the word, but that's where life is. He hates it when we worship. So guess what? We're going to do those two things every single stinking week. Together the good and the bad, all right? We're going to worship, and we're going to open God's word, and we're going to, and here's the thing too, we're going to invite others to come be a part of it too. And we're not going to give up, 
Because when the world sees Christ in us, he won't be denied. They'll deny us. If we try to do it in our own power, they'll deny. But the, when the world sees Christ, he won't be denied. And God will do whatever he wants through us, and he'll use us all for his glory according to our talents, abilities, or whatever. We just need to submit to him and, and just allow the Holy Spirit to move us together to grow in him. Amen? Amen. That's what we want. That is our desire. And we're going to sing a song about it, and then I'm going to do something special at the end of the service today. We're gonna, I'm going to pray and we'll close out our Facebook portion, but if you need to reach out to us in any way, if you want to come and worship with us, we'd love to have you here. If you watch us online but you've not been here before, we would love to have you here. We're going to pray. We're going to sing a song about the Holy Spirit just moving us together, bringing us to life, and then we're going to close out uh, with prayer. So let's do that, and then we'll sing together. Father God, thank you for this opportunity to get in your word today, God. Thank you for... Uh, brothers and sisters who are here for each and every person that watched today, uh, God. And, and my prayer now, Lord, as we, we move into um, this portion of our service today, of our time of worship together where we respond to the message. Maybe there's something today, Lord, that hit on us. And, and, and Lord, we know that, that maybe we have, I don't know, maybe we've been kind of uh, making things bigger in our lives than we need to or, or, or putting more importance on things. Uh, in our life, God, that we need to, and it's kind of taken us away from you. Maybe we need to remember who you are and what you've called us to do, um, God. And, 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 and maybe today, Lord, maybe today, God, our prayers as a church is that, Lord, whether it's individually, corporately, or whatever, God, I, I know we're alive as a church today, God, but maybe there are those within this room today, God, that they just need to be brought back to life by the power of the Holy Spirit. Maybe in the words of David, they need to remember the joy of their salvation and who they are in you and what you've done for them. So whatever we need to do today, God, in response, I pray that we do it. I pray that we sing your praises, that we worship you right now, and that you'll have your will in your way. And we ask it all in Jesus' name.